Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's event. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. We're a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia and a registered 501c3. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we've been around since the 1950s. We're nonpartisan and we're committed to bringing expert analysis and research uh, to policymakers and the public at large. Uh, this morning, or excuse me, this afternoon, we have a program on emerging technologies, uh, which, as those of you who follow it, know that the speed of technological advancement is quickly becoming a game changer, uh, not only in everyday life, but in the realm of national security. And it affects not only great global powers, but also smaller states who can take advantage of increasingly sophisticated off-the-shelf technologies. This is the first event in, our, uh, in a series to introduce our fall special issue of Orbis that's focused on emerging technology and national security. Uh, there will also be a link to Orbis in the chat window if you're interested in reading Orbis and you're not already a member or subscriber. Um, our moderator this morning is Dr. Lawrence Rubin, who is also the guest editor of our fall special issue of Orbis on emerging technologies and national security. Uh, Larry is an associate professor in the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at the Georgia Institute of Technology, Georgia Tech, and an associate fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, from 2017 to 2018, he served in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy as a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow. His policy and academic scholarship focuses on the Middle East politics, as well as international security, including nuclear proliferation and emerging technologies. Uh, before I turn it over to Larry to introduce our panel this afternoon, uh, let me first give a shout out to our members and supporters and board members. Uh, they support us and without them we could not do what we do. If you're not a member yet, do please take advantage of this opportunity to become a member and we will have instructions on how to do that in the chat window. And a reminder, if you want to become a subscriber to Orbis, uh, there's a small fee to add it on to your membership and then you can be, become a member. Um, for those of you who are male subscribers, and I am among you, uh, we have yet received in the mail, I haven't, uh, the fall Orbis, so it should be coming shortly though. We have, we have print editions in the office, so we know it's en route. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, on the bottom of your screen is a Q&A button. That is where you put your questions for our panel. And you can go ahead and start putting them in right away and we'll turn to those questions about halfway through the program. Uh, do not put them in the chat box. The chat box is uh, a place to put questions if for instance you have problems with your technology or working the Zoom. Um, and the chat box is also where we'll be sending messages to you like how to access Orbis. Uh, so put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, so, and I'd also like to at the same time also give a special thanks to Georgia Tech and um, uh, our uh, faculty and visitors from Georgia Tech who were full participants in our fall edition of Orbis. So without further ado, Larry, I'll turn it, turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Raleigh. And um, I want to also thank you um, to give a thank you to FPRI for creating this space, uh, both through the printed work in Orbis and through hosting this webinar series. Um, I'd also like to thank, as again, my home institution at Georgia Tech for supporting my efforts uh, to launch these conversations, which bring together technical experts and social scientists to contribute their voices to national security debates. And we look forward to future collaboration. So my role as a guest editor for the special issue and moderator for this panel, I have the privilege of introducing our two fabulous panelists, Dr. Michael Horowitz and Dr. Uh, Margaret Kozel. Um, I'll ask them some broad questions on emerging technology and national security and then open it up for discussion. We wanna leave plenty of time for that. So both of our panelists are accomplished scholars and have served in government positions relevant for their subject matter expertise. In alphabetical order, Dr. Michael Horowitz is director of Perry Worldhouse, professor of political science, professor in the political science department at University 
Pennsylvania and a research fellow at FBRI. Dr. Horwitz has published extensively in academic and policy journals in the intersection of emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence or robotics with global politics and uh, military innovation and the role of leaders in international politics and geopolitical forecasting methodology. His government service includes a time at the Office of, Sec of the Sec Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in the Department of Defense. And for this special issue, he contributed an article with Lauren Kahn and Casey Mahoney titled, The Future of Military Applications of Artificial Intelligence, A Role for Confidence Building Measures. There's a question mark, sorry. Uh, which discusses the ways in which confidence building measures can be used to mitigate AI-related risks and warfare. Dr. Uh, Maggie or Margaret Kozel is associate professor in the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs and an affiliate of uh, affiliate faculty of the Parker H. Petit uh, Institute for, Pettit, uh, for Bioengineering and Bioscience at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Dr. Kozel's research focuses on two often intersecting areas, reducing the threat of weapons of mass destruction and understanding the role of emerging technologies for security. In particular, the latter includes work on nanotechnology and biosecurity, where her PhD in chemistry from the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign serves her quite well. And she served two stints in government as a senior advisor to the chief of staff of the US Army as part of a strategic studies, inaugural strategic studies uh, group. And before that, for joining the Nunn School, she was a science and technology advisor within the Office of Secretary of Defense for um, policy. And Dr. Koza's contribution, uh, emerging, emerging life sciences and possible threats to international security, that new thinking uh, argues that new thinking is required for biosecurity um, and that net these, and examines some of these national security implications of one revolutionary biotechnology, CRISPR, otherwise or known as the clustered uh, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. And she will get into that a bit. Uh -huh. Before I turn it over to them, let me say a few words about the purpose of this special issue and the series more generally. Uh, the motivation behind this special issue and the future programming is really to bring together different perspectives to better understand how emerging technologies affect global peace and security. These efforts contribute to this ongoing national conversation by bringing together technical expertise, policy analysis, and practitioners' perspectives. The need comes from the fact that conversations about emerging technology and national security tend to be siloed along professional lines whereby it's much easier for bureaucratic and professional reasons for these communities to talk amongst themselves rather than across communities. For the US, the objective is to avoid a misalignment between design decisions, uh, national industrial policy, and the operational strategic needs for deterrence and warfighting. This means policy discussions sh discussion should be more about the techno uh, should include more about the technological implications as well as possibilities and technical discussions could include more about what the policy limitations and possibilities might be due to existing laws and authorities. <clears throat> With that in mind, let me take a quick plug again for the and to zoom back out as to why this is important in a broader context. We know about rising regional powers and global powers are racing to develop these capabilities, which they hope will enhance their and transform their war fighting capabilities. There's an intensifying uh, competition around this and a lot of hype and energy. Much has been written around these nail technologies. This is a chance to get a better understanding. This special issue covers a number of them from uh, AI, satellite technologies, cybersecurity, 5G, and practitioners' perspectives on technology and strategy from, for example, Admiral Winnefeld and General Breedlove, and the impact of climate change on national security. And today we are blessed to have the special, the contributions of two of these, and I'm pleased to integrate their contributions into a broader discussion about emerging technologies. And we look forward to the audience's active engagement and participation. So we'll, we'll go for about half, uh, about uh, 25, 30 minutes or so from now with my questions to the uh, panelists and then turn it over to the, the esteemed audience to um, entertain your questions. So let me start, I'll start alphabetically with Dr. Michael Horowitz for the first question. What is an emerging tech, an emerging or disruptive technology, and do you think it's more important today than it's been in the past? Thanks a lot, Larry. Uh, I appreciate it, and thanks to uh, thanks to FPRI for for having me. It's always a, it's always an honor to join FPRI for an event, uh, e even if virtually. You know, it's such an important think tank both in in Philadelphia uh, and the world. And uh, I would be remiss if I did not start by by shouting out my great co-authors, uh, Lauren Kahn and Casey Mahoney 
who both uh, work with me at Penn, uh, at, at Perry World House, and played a, a crucial role in, in thinking about the, you know, the ideas and actually getting it down on paper uh, for the, the article that came out in, in Orvis. So when I think about emerging technologies in general, I think about novelty of technology. I think about the growth trajectory of technology, and I think about uncertainty. And the article we wrote actually focuses a lot on that uncertainty aspect, which I can get into, or which I can get into in a bit. And today, when we think about emerging technologies, they generally refer to a cluster of technologies, you know, AI, robotics, bio, cyber, quantum, that are considered one, important for US national security, and two, where people think that the degree of integration of those technologies from a national security perspective will be much higher, say, a, a generation from now than it is today, even though a lot of these technologies, and you can think about various aspects of bio here, uh, of cyber, uh, of AI and robotics, have actually been around for, for quite a while in one way, or, uh, one way or another. I think that there are a couple of reasons to think that emerging technologies today may be relatively more important than we've tended to think in the past. And that's because a lot of the emerging technologies today look a little more like general purpose technologies than specific widgets. So general purpose technologies are, you know, imagine a nuclear weapon as a very specific, you know, specific thing. And a general purpose technology is something like the combustion engine or, or the steam engine or electricity something that isn't just a, a particular widget, but that can have applications across the waterfront from, from society to the economy to, to militaries uh, and beyond. And a lot of the sorts of technologies we're talking about today are probably more general purpose technologies than even dual use technologies. And that's really important because it means that their impact on national security, their impact on the international security environment will be twofold. First, the direct impact, you know, as you say, advances in algorithms or things you can plug in to everything from how militaries train soldiers to potential applications at the battlefield, but also indirect as advances in general purpose technology shape industries, shape economic capacity, and then feed back into military power from a longer term perspective. So it's not just about the short term uh, impact on power. And this is really important because, uh, because the way that we think emerging technologies today is so the second broad point there, the way that uh, a lot of these technologies today are being driven by the commercial sector rather than militaries. I mean, in some ways it's now, I feel like almost everybody in this call probably already knows this, but when we, when we talked about technological development during the Cold War, we tended to think that it was a process the military drove where there were spin offs into the civilian sector. Whereas today, a lot of the technologies covered in this issue, and my article would certainly count, are technologies where advances are being driven by the private sector, by market forces, by, by not just you know, three or four defense primes, but by, by companies in multiple countries, all of which have a market interest in advancing these technologies. And then there are applications in the military sector. It reverses the innovation dynamic in a way. And that makes it really challenging especially when some of these emerging technologies, there's a, a, larger, a larger uncertainty parameter surrounding the way that they will function uh, for militaries and in international politics. You can imagine that as technologies get more mature, the a degree of certainty we have about what is possible, how it will work, how much confidence we should have in it, you know, all of that goes down. We get more confident. We know how these things can be used and we know what the relative impact will look like. When we're talking about some of these more general purpose emerging technologies, the uncertainty parameter is simply higher and that makes it really hard to plan. And one thing that militaries don't like is when they can't plan. And you know, that can be really challenging then and, and raises the prospect of, of potentially significant consequences for the balance of power. If you imagine large scale technological changes that could be really important for the basic inputs of how militaries generate power, but where there's a lot of uncertainty about what actually to do, which makes planning difficult. And that's why I think today, it's especially important to be thinking about the way that these technologies will shape the security environment moving forward. Thanks.
Great. Thanks so much for the, the really fascinating and comprehensive response there. And I want to turn this to um, Dr. Kozel as well. And, and after this, I'm going to shed the formalities and refer to you as I know you best by your first names. Uh, but um, I'm, uh, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts of your kind of how you understand merging and disruptive technologies, how do you think it's more or less relevant than in the past? And then maybe I'll ask you a little bit about the article, if not weave it in there in some capacity. Uh, so first off, uh, thank you, Larry, for the invitation. Um, Raleigh and colleagues from uh, FPRI, thank you for hosting this. Really appreciate that. Um, you know, so to this question, and I appreciate, um, you know, Michael giving the, the sort of broad overview and putting it in the context, you know, emerging technologies have always been happening, you know, so it's what is different and that's a really critical question is, is there something different now. Um, and we certainly should differentiate between emerging technologies and disruptive technologies. And one of the things that my work looks at is, are these fundamentally disruptive technologies or are they evolutionary? And how do you tell when something is going to have strategic significance if it is an evolutionary piece or if it is revolutionary or certainly disruptive. You know, when we look at, you know, why, is emerg why are emerging technologies getting a lot of attention now? And as somebody who's been in this field for, you know, more years than I want to acknowledge now, you know, we're, we're, at, we're at a, you know, the Gardner peak of the hype cycle right now in terms of emerging technologies, particularly in the national security area. Um, they've always been there, and there are going to always continue to be new technologies coming up. You know, the why we're paying so much attention to them now reflects not technologies, but it reflects the broader geopolitics and the strategic situation that we're in. So there certainly are aspects that Mike alluded to. You have more players. Um, Historically, you know, if we look at through the lens of bio, if you go back to the initial gene editing techniques, that was something that you, it was very much a US with some friends from the UK and a few lawyers. Now this technology is dispersed and we're seeing some of the pushing back coming from other nations. Again, if we look at CRISPR, one of the applications that got a huge amount of attention was the use by the Chinese scientist, Jung Ka He, who used it to edit the germline of fetuses. So things are happening in different places and more places. So the traditional means that we might say of governance, control, regulation, aren't there. And that's one of the pieces of why emerging technologies are rising to the level of concern, the forefront. You know, it is, there's always been the uncertainty, but it's what are the other geopolitical, economical forces that are going on now? So I'll turn it back over to you, Larry. Great, thanks. And I was wondering also, you know, if you want to give us a little bit um, about, uh, I know you mentioned your, your article, you want to give us a little bit more kind of where, um, you know, what some of the motivations are, were for it and how it kind of uh, relates and why you think this is so important. So the piece that I wrote for Orbis focused on CRISPR, one of these gene editing techniques. Um, now, first of all, CRISPR is not the only advanced gene editing technique. There are things like zinc finger nucleases and talents. These are in some ways further along, particularly in therapeutic trials than CRISPR. What CRISPR represents as one might imagine it is sort of like command and control, but for DNA. And so that's where I come into this is looking at this from a question that I asked in some previous work is, is there something that 
might challenge nuclear weapons in the context of strategic stability. And if one looks at not necessarily CRISPR, but these gene editing techniques, that can provide us with one potential scenario that might begin to challenge nuclear weapons. Now, these are not, we're not talking about traditional biological weapons. And also want to be very clear that don't have things, concepts of operations in these. And one that is because we don't have the concepts of operations yet. You know, Chris, if you're doing germline gene editing, it looks a lot like in vitro fertilization. That's not something that can be mass deployed. Also driven by the fact that I'm not going to give somebody a recipe for doing something that might have unwanted consequences. So, you know, that's where I come from in this article. And I want to be, you know, I don't want to just limit my discussion to advances in biotechnology, because certainly, as you know, that's not where my 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 work lives. Um, and I see that there have been a couple of questions in the Q and A, you know, on things like quantum computing. Um, and you know, that's where we get into another potential example that might challenge our current strategic stability. Some of the applications of quantum computing may enable, and notice I'm using these sort of these these words because it, it is it, we don't have this may enable detection of nuclear submarines and if you can start detecting nuclear submarines then we're challenging our basic second strike capability and that has implications for strategic stability um, you know so that's one of the applications of an emerging technology that i would set out there as being critically important that we need to be looking at rather than some of the other things people have talked about quantum computing you know with with the uh, uh, 256 512 bit encryption um, that's actually probably going to be less of a problem back to you great thanks thanks for that uh detailed response as well and i've noticed you've kind of clued me into the some of the great questions that are coming in already um, and, and to make a plug for something future in the sense of what we hope in, to have in, in some capacity is more on some of these additional technologies and really combine, we hope, or some technological expert, expertise with social scientists and policy people to really work on this stuff. Because I know a lot of like us who aren't the technological experts on this or um, really want to ask themselves a lot of questions on how to make better policy that way. Um, I'm going to ask, because we have such great questions, I'm going to ask both of you kind of one last uh, mm -hmm. question. You may have already answered in some capacity, and then I'll turn it over. Um, so, Mike, I guess I'll go back to you and ask a little bit. Do you, um, what do you think the uh, national security community should be paying more attention to? Um, and then, and then maybe, uh, if you want to say what should be paying less attention to, and there might be more hype uh, to that extent. And you can say AI because I wrote about it. <laughs> That's perfectly fine with me. But, um, but I know you can answer the latter too. Sure. I mean. I'll I think it's a great question. I might say AI for both, both more attention and less attention. And by that, what I mean is that if you, if you looked at or measured American military interest in AI based on senior leader statements about AI, you know, what a, what a top ranking generals and admirals say, you know, what a defense secretary say, then, then you would think that the, the U.S. Department of Defense is all about AI. <laughs> You know, ditto for uh, for plenty of other militaries. If you look at sort of Russian statements, Chinese statements, you know, et cetera. When you look at what's actually happening on the ground, I think that there's a gap between discourse, you know, between discourse and reality, or between rhetoric and reality, in that a lot of the investments in algorithms for military purposes are relatively early stage. I mean, there are there are applications, you know, think uh, image recognition algorithms, things like Project Maven that. Uh, where you're dealing with like relatively more mature algorithms where one can imagine potential implementation in the, uh, in the shorter term. But there's also a lot of experiment, you know, very early stage kind of research and development still going on, which is appropriate given uncertainties about the technology, given issues surrounding the explainability of algorithms and thus whether commanders would trust using them 
in high leverage situations, all, all of those sorts of things. So I think in, in some ways, it's not that the United States, you know, and, 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 and I'm talking about the US, but I think from, from a global, I think this applies from a global perspective as well, that the, that the key here is less about the technology itself than what national security communities will do about it. And that we know from military history that it's, it's rarely about the tech in and of itself. Maybe nuclear weapons are an exception to that, but it's rarely about the tech in and of itself. It's usually about what organizations decide to do with technology, whether it's the intelligence community, whether it's militaries, whether it's, you know, whether, whether it's diplomats. I think the same will be true when it comes to AI. And that in some ways means we need more attention paid to how you would actually change doctrine, concepts of operation, you know, operational planning in response to you know, smarter machines, you know, so to speak, uh, and maybe less attention paid to the like, OMG, like, look at what the tech can do, you know, look at what the tech could do in this controlled vacuum that doesn't in any way represent the battlefield. No, those, yeah, those are great points. Um, Maggie, let me turn it over to you. Uh, some of your, the same type of thoughts. I love that uh, question, and I will double tap on everything that Mike said. Um, you know, so looking through a lens of AI, it's a great example of where there are things that have gotten a great deal of attention that perhaps are not the ones that we might say we really should be worrying about. Um, and, you know, in some of the places, it's the AI, it's the concerns about lethal autonomous weapons and the autonomy issues. Um, that's some place where I would say we've gotten a lot of attention, probably more hype. Um, and, you know, as Mike was saying, you know, it's, it, doctrine, command control, uh, you know, fighter pilots are not going to give up control. Um, they're controlling if you ever know any fighter pilots. They're wonderful. They're chosen for these aspects. Um, on the other hand, if we look at AI, a place that I'm really concerned about that is not getting as much attention as it should is bias in machine learning data sets. Now, we've all probably seen, anybody who's followed AI has seen some of the examples looking at things like racial bias. And we know that U.S. Uh, systems are, cannot identify very well black faces. Interestingly enough, Chinese systems do really well with Asian faces, can't do well with non-Asian faces. Okay, so that we all know. What has gotten a lot less attention are things where bias comes in that we're not attuned to. There was a, a report about six months ago in Nature um, where they were looking at machine learning having to do with synthetic reactions. And they found that bias in the in initial inputs affected the products in a chemical reaction. That's not what we're, you know, we see bias, we think about racism, sexism. These internal biases in these machine learning data sets that are being used in many times for, for good purposes, um, that's a piece that I worry about also when it connects up with things like cyber intrusions, um, are you changing the data set? So there's sort of one of the things to pay, that I think needs to be paid attention to. Also, countermeasures to AI. You know, we've heard some folks talk about AI is going to fundamentally change the way guerrillas and insurgents because they won't be able to uh, behave. We, all one has to do is look to Hong Kong where you had the use of really simple stuff to undermine machine learning and some of the surveillance. Hype. My two big things that I think have gotten way too much hype, hypersonics. Um, so I'm putting out some things there people can argue with. And 3D printing, additive manufacturing. Both, okay, so additive manufacturing, really cool, does have some potential to change um, aspects of supply chain. It is not going to affect 
you know, nuclear weapons production and proliferation the way some people have, have suggested it is. If there is going to be a 3D printing that might be interested, it's where it's going to intersect with things like bioprinting. Um, things to look for that aren't getting as much attention, perhaps, converging sciences, where these different things come together, um, metamaterials. So that's a type of nanotechnology that enables stealth. Um, you know, so are we going to have uh, stealth tanks? What does that mean? I've done some work looking at the implications of this type of stealth capability for different scenarios. Um, and then augmentation. So someplace, where are we looking at where the, the neuroscience intersects with the robotics, intersects with um, ICTs, information and computing technologies, a little bit of machine learning. Um, and so these are all really big questions. And it, it's very difficult to speak to them sort of without binning them. And that becomes a fundamental challenge as, you know, we're tr whether it's my work, Mike's work, your work, any of our colleagues' work, is how do we, we have to make some decisions because otherwise you're just looking at the world of everything. Back to you. Great, thanks for thanks so much also for kind of elaborating on a lot of points. And, and um, uh, you've really both brought up a lot of really interesting things and kind of certainly seeing the questions come in, they intersect with a lot of the questions uh, in different ways. And I'm gonna combine a few here um, and do my best to um, to to get to all of them today. We have actually a good amount of time left, but there are a lot of questions. Um, so first I'm kind of combining questions from Jerry Rubenstein and David uh, Persole. Um, and it has to do with quantum, it has to do with um, quantum computing. And um, can you, this is directed to Dr. Horwitz, but actually this one probably be good for both of you to answer because I'd like to take, a, take um, the liberty to expand it a little bit. Can you discuss the game-changing impact if China achieves first application uses of quantum computing, such as um, applied to encryption or decryption? Um, and um, what I wanted to kind of see if it's not specifically for that type of question, um, the big question comes is whether, um, you know, is, is how much are we overhyping the idea of being first? Uh, is it better to be second and so forth? And I'd like to hear hear you guys uh, weigh in or does it depend on technology and so forth? So feel free to kind of answer um, as you wish. Uh, um, Mike, I'll turn it over to you first and then, and then go to Maggie. Sure, I mean, I think that, that quantum is a good example of something where there's a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of noise relative to signal out there and a lot of, and a lot of hype and that, you know, are there, have there been advances and progress toward quantum computing? Sure, I mean, but I mean, look at some of the discussions about the, you know, like IBM has this concept of quantum volume now to try to account for sort of, you know, the measure of the quality of the circuits that one can run, you know, with a quantum computer is there, is there trying to essentially, you know, almost trying to figure out how is it in a world where you don't have practical quantum computers that are being you know, used out there on a regular basis for national security purposes, how can we measure progress you know, sort of in this? And, and in that way, I think that the, I mean, does it matter if China is first at achieving various quantum benchmarks? Sure, it's better to be, I mean, yes, and that it's better to be first than not first, I guess, and, you know, in that, in that kind of, in this sort of conception, but quantum computing doesn't seem like an arena where the, where the uh, being locked out is plausible, like where being first can really matter is, is say, you know, imagine a market where being first gives you monopoly power such that, you know, others won't have incentives to invest. If say, US and Chinese companies are competing and really close to about the same sorts of places in, in quantum advances, then if China happens to get there, uh, happens to get to a particular benchmark first, it doesn't necessarily mean that the US is you know, excluded from the competition. I mean, maybe it means that there's a, a shorter period of time where it's easier for the Chinese to encrypt their communications. Maybe it means that the 
that the U.S. intelligence community would need to be more careful about the way uh, how some of its networks are shielded. But that would be that's true anyway. Frankly, if you look at some of the cyber issues that we faced over the last few decades without quantum computing, and and so I think that I think quantum is less a classic sort of first mover, second mover. Uh, case in that way, but it's also, frankly, just, I think, tougher to this, I think quantum among a lot of these areas is an area where the amount of hype relative to practical progress that would be usable on the ground is pretty high, and it, that can make it tough to unpack. Great. Uh, Maggie, do you want to chime in? Or? I think you're on mute. To... Thank you. Um, you know, so certainly we know that in at least one area, quantum internet, China has already achieved it. Um, the question is, is that meaningful? And so far, it isn't meaningful. Um, you know, do we, should we be concerned about um, first mover, you know, being fast follower, you know, yeah, I, I don't, I concur with, with Mike in the, the sense that some of these, it's what, what's the meaningful benchmark? Um, you know, in, in the, the, the quantum computing is one of those things that is truly at the point where it is emerging. Um, we, you know, we have not done some of these things that we're looking at as having implications. Scientists have not done them or are just doing them for the first time. Um, versus some of the things that we're talking about that often get put into, you know, emerging tech, uh, for example, remotely piloted aircraft that have been around. Those are emerged tech. So this gives it more, there's more uncertainty. Am I concerned about China's interest and driving in this? Yes, and I think that goes to a piece that we haven't necessarily touched on either in our discussion or in, in the chat, which is the fundamental basic research side. And we, our biggest risk is that we lose prominence in that fundamental basic research. You know, for all that we talk about how technologies are coming out of companies rather than the way they used to um, or are perceived to have used to, most of the, what gets called the seed corn for these technologies is still coming out of universities um, or places like the Navy Research Lab. Um, and that's a place where strategically we need to invest more in the basic researches, research. And one can look to what China's doing, and they are continually to invest more in basic research, where we are making decisions that result in less, um, as adjusted for inflation, investment in things like basic research. Over. Great. That actually leads us into another related question, um, and I want to combine two from, uh, um, from uh, Bill Schneider from the Defense Science Board, and Frank Hoffman's question as well touches on parts of this. Uh, the, the big question is a, is, a, is a big question for the two of you um, in the sense of uh, what suggestions might you have for how these emerging technologies such as AI or biotech should be addressed in the industrial base for national defense? Um, and, uh, and we think about it in terms of, uh, you know, how the, the defense industrial base is, has less than 12,000 cleared companies while the industrial base pertinent to national defense is much, much larger. Mm -hmm. um, but DOD is only a minor user or customer. Um, and I know I think some of you have thought about this a little bit for, before in this way. And, and, and to Frank's question, if I can try to um, combine this a little bit, but um, does this affect any aspect of how, um, how you might think about um, evolutionary um, changes with uh, um, uh, change me remaining evolutionary, or, or does it have anything to do, a new spin on capabilities that way? Is it, would, would this changing this policy affect any of this? Uh, 
if I, sorry, since I didn't call anybody and probably confounded the questions, I'll go back to Mike. Uh, yeah, I, I was actually going to invite Margaret to go first, but uh, okay. I'm happy to go. I thought you might need a rest, Maggie, so go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I uh, find really fascinating uh, Bill Schneider's question. So, you know, this issue of the defense industrial base, I think it's a, a really important one as we go into the 21st century, is what does that mean? So yes, I understand that there are cleared companies and there, there is a very specific acquisition process aspect to that that is really important. But as an academic now, so I can conceptualize much more largely, you know, so what does it mean for a company to be part of the defense industrial base? Um, certainly back now, more years than I want to admit, um, when I was in OSD working in the Green Line, which became the Transformational Medical Technology Initiative, one of the challenges then was we were thinking about how do you engage companies that are likely to be able to deliver medical therapeutics or countermeasures? This was way before COVID. You know, so that wasn't even thinking about emerging technologies. It was thinking about how do we deal with the federal acquisition requirements? And, you know, I'm not an authority on, on the FAR by any means. You know, so these are a fundamental question of, of that really needs people thinking about it because not only does it have implications for the DOD directly, but it also becomes important when you start thinking about ITAR, um, when we're at the technology side, um, and it becomes important when we start thinking about supply chains in the context of, is it an ally who it supplies something that is critically important, or is there a node someplace that has a potential to be uh, interrupted and it is not a uh, NATO ally? Back over to you. I mean, I, I would just add that I think that this is related, this is all integrally related to the question of acquisition reform yeah. from an American military perspective, at least. And the, it, I think every administration probably since the 80s, if not before, has said like, oh, we're going to make defense acquisition, you know, more rapid, more flexible, you know, et cetera. And, you know, the latest is the, um, is the uh, adaptive acquisition framework that uh, Undersecretary, Lord, uh, Undersecretary, Undersecretary Lord announced. And the, this seems particularly relevant in a world of emerging technologies in a world where uh, I, I think both of the points made in those questions are true, both that for a lot of the key industry players, DOD is a relatively small part of their budget, and where the speed of the technology curve for some of these technologies is unknown. Uh, what that would suggest is that, you know, we've had this regular process, say, in the United States, where you have basic research, applied research, you know, prototyping into a program of record. And then, you know, eventually like 20 years later, you get like a thing. And if, but if technological change is happening faster, then in some ways you want to be prototyping right away. And you want to think more about smaller, uh, smaller production runs, recognizing technology will change because there's not just going to be one point where, oh, now it's ready. Like now we do the big buy. And in, so in one way, you know, so that means changing how, from an American perspective, at least, and, you know, the questions are for sort of more from an American perspective, you know, the, how we think about acquisition in the first place, since we need to, to transform the way that then we incentivize program managers, the way that requirements are written, and, you know, and then especially what the size of buys look like. Because I don't think, I mean, to the, to the point about the industrial base, you, know, you can imagine different kinds of things that will will change how that looks in in some of these some of the larger tech companies can could produce spin-offs themselves and you know those spin-offs could be more highly incentivized to work in the defense sector but the you know I think one of the outputs if you look at some of the research that the the National Security Commission on AI is doing suggests that a lot of the companies that that people were worried about departing from the defense sector, say like, uh, like Google a couple of years ago after the Project Maven controversy are kind of coming home a little bit and actually wish to work in the defense sector if the, 
rules of the game can be written in a way that allows them to. So I, I guess I'm less worried about those companies not wanting to work with DOD anymore. I'm more worried about can we actually create processes to get their uh, get their their insights and technology you know spun on into defense fast enough before it's already obsolete. Great. Can I oh, ping in one more thing that I just thought of? The, there's another piece which is the people that it is critically important that we continue to have people in America that um, are technical and are either clearable or willing to work on it. And historically, the United States has benefited from immigrants. Um, often the people who end up being our Nobel Prize winners are second generation immigrants. Uh, you know, again, this gets to be potentially uh, political, uh, but our, uh, limp some of the recent policies to limit individuals here on student visas are fundamentally undermining our national security because the last, we, we need these people to stay here, to be working here and to contribute to our um, intellectual base, our technological base, our entre entrepreneurial base. Over. Great, thanks, thanks so much. And I think even parts of say uh, the task force, the national security innovation base touched on, on elements, but didn't, of course, you know, it had to be relatively sensitive politically because it become, became a political, uh, um, because it is a political issue there. But I think a lot of us at universities also um, know the struggles and the challenges both on the protection of information side, but also in terms of supply of, um, of, of talent. Um, uh, I want to shift gears a little bit um, just to give a, another mode of those that might be interested in a little bit. And I have a question here about um, how would you say the technology affects uh, intelligence collection in terms of modes of information collection? I think you guys have talked, you've touched on it a bit in some aspects, mm -hmm. but see if you have, either of you have any um, additional thoughts. And um, uh, uh, I will go to, uh, who's the last, Maggie spoke last. Let me go back to, uh, to Mike and then we'll switch back. If you have, if you have comments. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I think that the, I think technology affects intelligence collection in a couple of different ways. You know, one is, you know, I'll, I'll use an AI example since I've been talking a bunch about AI, you know, to the extent that algorithms help with the speed of information processing. One of the biggest challenges that countries around the world have faced over the last few decades is that as digital surveillance is ramped up from a national security perspective, how do you actually find the information? You know, you have, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of data. What do you do with that data? Whether that's battlefield surveillance data or intel or, you know, good old fashioned sort of intelligence, uh, intelligence information, or even, you know, how do you, pro how do you process the, you know, forms that people are sending in that have relevant, could have relevant intelligence information in them. And, you know, that's a case where you have enough data that tr using machine learning to train algorithms to do sort of some first order cuts at, uh, at, at that kind of raw intelligence information might provide some advantages in doing things like assessing, assessing satellite data, uh, you know, other sorts of things. So I think that there are potential, there are potential upsides there. The, the big challenge with all of this is the bias question, I think, that, uh, that my colleague raised before, that the, you know, algorithms are only as, uh, or the outputs you get from algorithms are only going to be as good as the training data and as good as the, as good as, and as good as the coder. And to the extent that we write biased code that doesn't consider key inputs, we will end up with algorithms that are less useful from an intelligence perspective. But I, I think intelligence collection is actually an area where there's a lot of potential upside for AI. Obviously there's a lot of potential impact, you know, potentially from, uh, from quantum and uh, where the defensive task in some ways is gonna be, you know, larger maybe even than the offensive task. Great, thanks. And um, I have more questions if you want to get to them or if uh, you can move on to that, unless Maggie had something uh, you wanted to add. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, to, to this very much, there are a whole number of places where uh, a number of these emerging technologies will have impact and could have had impact um, in the past. And these, these, some of these are not 
hypothetical. For example, uh, there are a number of cases, well, a couple cases that I'm aware of in Afghanistan in which IEDs were planted and you had reapers going over, but they were taking what one might call like a soda straw view um, that was being observed. And there was actually under the, the WAS, WAS uh, system, turned out there's a lot more data that was coming in. So it is, we've got these things like synthetic aperture radar, which just pull in too much data that a person or even a group of people are not gonna be able to do it. The critical point comes into being able to then have a point at which something says here, hey, we need a human to come in and look at this. Um, and in a couple cases, we know that it's been observed where um, insurgents were coming in, you could watch them digging uh, in these large, large spaces, but it wasn't noticed until afterwards. Um, there are other uh, potential applications, like looking at proliferation. What are the signals, what is, especially in large amounts of data that's going, that a country might be pulling in, in terms of uh, what, what they're bringing in as indicators? Um, so there's certainly another one. And then something we haven't talked a lot about is robotics. Um, in particular, you know, uh, certainly UAVs are an example of robotics that has, has had a significant effect. Um, but I'm more interested at this point thinking about things like what is the Navy doing with undersea vehicles in places like China um, or, off, or near Iran. Um, also, uh, the Army's been looking into robotics in ways that are aiming to incorporate these robotics, not only just into sort of the deployment, but as part of training. And that brings up a couple of the questions that were brought up in the Q&A, which is, you know, how does this change ethics and your normative view when you are training with a robot, when it is part of the the team that you're developing part of the squad. Um, and then there's also the flip side is, if the reason you've got a robot is so it can do the dirty, dangerous, and boring work, well, what happens then if it is gets destroyed or is someplace that you then put humans at risk to recover? Because either people are attached to it Humans develop attachments to robots. We know that. Um, or then the even more insidious, if you've got, you know, a somewhere you've got a sergeant who's got the property book, and if you don't bring back that robot, it's a ding on your record. You know, so that's, a tr it sounds trivial, but these, you know, are sort of, this is the, uh, you know, the Army's version of thinking about the federal acquisitions reform. How do we deal with these pieces? And I just wanted to bring some of those. They're not, some of those are ethics. Some of those are pieces that have to do with the organizations and culture. Over. Great. Th thanks so much. And it helps kind of get to some of our other questions there, which we will run out of time. And I think in about three, four minutes, I'm going to get a, a lasso for the closing part of it. But we, I think we got part of Lawrence Husick's question. Um, and, uh, and part of Nicholas Moon's and also touched on the ethics one. So I wanted to throw out two of them uh, that I saw up there and I apologize for others. One is, um, does the appearance of these technologies, um, um, of these emerging technologies in the private sector affect alliances um, such as NATO? Um, and um, does it add new stresses or create new opportunities? And the other question, and feel free to answer just uh, one of them, another one, we had one about um, foreign affairs article with um, Admiral Winnefeld and Graham Allison in terms of um, uh, how does it need to focus on emerging tech um, relate to these reviews. I have an, another one about third offset, but I will, I will hold, that, um, uh, hold that right now. So feel free to answer, answer those and choose what you like and, and, um, uh, and go ahead. Let me go to, I'll go to, I'll go back to Maggie and then to Mike. Oh, I want to go to Mike first. Give me a moment. All right. You guys fight. <laughs> sure. Uh, all right, the, the really short since we're running out of time, maybe we can get in something else as well. The, the, I think that the, I think these emerging technology areas 
create new opportunities for collaboration among free societies and democracies. I, you've seen, I think there's a lot of energy if you look at the, uh, some of the think tank world in DC and Japan and Germany about the idea essentially of an alliance of free societies that can collaborate on technology much, much as, as you know, sort of like our side you know, did during the Cold War uh, against the Soviet Union with the idea being that the size of the Chinese market and the way and the uh, unequal market access issues that we've spent more time talking about over the last couple of years, but existed long before the Trump administration, that the way to deal with that in some ways, it, it, in part, it is to have uh, more collaboration across countries within the confines of, of, our, of our strong allies and partners, which means NATO, Japan, Australia, South Korea, uh, you know, others, that there's a lot of potential actually there for cooperation to ensure that free societies uh, stay in the lead when it comes to emerging technologies. So many uh, fascinating things to sort of go off on. Um, you know, with looking at these emerging technologies, there's always the risk. Um, and that's why it's important for people, sometimes even the people are, who will stand up and say the things we don't wanna hear um, about things that we need to watch out for. Um, it is important to, to be engaged earnestly and as a um, you know, a l legitimate, not just to be, be a, a spear thrower. Um, and, you know, so, and that goes to how free societies, how uh, the, the need for collaboration. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was involved in a uh, conference that was with, was sponsored by the US Embassy in Tokyo. And, you know, so a lot of it was about how can we build Japan US relations. And there's a place where, again, if we look at robotics as an exemplar, and certainly some quantum uh, computing aspects, they're pushing ahead, and particularly in robotics, in the translation from the science to the implementable technology through a very different lens. They're not looking at it in national security. It has to do with the aging demographics and robotics uh, to care for people. Um, you know, so one of the, the other questions that was in the Q&A, again, I was from uh, Bill Schneider, you know, does, you know, about China's sort of civilian military fusion. I actually think that that is not an advantage. In the 21st century, and frankly, along in the past, often the most disruptive technologies that have utility, usefulness, are ones that come from people who aren't thinking about just national security. It's, you know, what are people thinking about in a different direction that answers or solves a problem? And that's why I brought up the Japan with their emphasis on robots to care for people has enabled pushing forward interactive robotics in ways that we should be taking advantage of. I hope that made sense. I was pulling together a whole bunch of ideas. Maybe it just reflects me as an American, um, but I don't see this China's uh, civilian military, everything being military, a, uh, a necessarily a strength. Um, because certainly we can look to the DPRK with the, you know, Jucha, and that's not a strength. Over. Great. And uh, thank you. The, actually, it's perfectly on, on the hour. We want to be respectful of uh, our panelists' time as well as the audience, which uh, I'd like to say thank you so much for attending. Um, thank you to FPRI, to Orbis. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Raleigh to say a thank you. I'd like to personally thank the panelists because I, even though having done this as a guest editor, I just learned a ton. Um, and this is why I do what I do. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over and say thank you to Raleigh as well. <laughs> Well, certainly thank you to Margaret, Michael, and Larry for this amazing discussion. And uh, if you enjoyed it, uh, there will be a, if you enjoyed it, if you learned from it, there will be a video recording of it that will be sent out to all the participants in this event, and we'll be posting that on our, our YouTube channel. 
Um, so thank you again very much and to our audience for joining us today. We also welcome your feedback. Uh, let us know if, if you found this interesting, uh, areas you'd like to hear more about. Uh, national security and technology is something that we're going to be doing more on, so uh, we welcome your feedback. Uh, thank you again and all the best to you. Stay safe and um, all the best. <laughs>